Well, good morning, everybody. I'm David. I'm Mark. Uh, we'll be going over employment and COVID, uh, issues such as pay compression and unemployment entitlements, how they're impacting uh, our current workforce. Our initial article was on a playset maker in Maine. Um, during this uh, period, uh, he has seen higher demand than ever before in his life. With everybody staying home, uh, families are wanting play sets to keep their kids occupied, at least the parents go nuts. And so he's having a hard time keeping up with uh, the new demand being put on him. The problem is, even during this record-setting unemployment, he's having trouble being able to bring in workers to be able to meet that new demand put upon them. And uh, we're going to be focusing on some of those issues that uh, employers are now facing bringing employees into the workforce when there's so many pressures that could be keeping them out of it. Very true. So why is it hard to find workers in the largely unemployed America? So America's unemployment rate as of mid-April was 14.7% which is the highest unemployment rate since records have officially been kept uh, as of 1948. So, and that was only in mid-April, as of April 18th. From April 18th to May, early May, unemployment has increased another, another additional 7 million Americans, which is about, uh, uh, which is increases the percent rate almost uh, 1 to 2% more. Uh, and that's more people being laid off and the way that they find that out is through unemployment insurance. Uh, a, a, quick, a quick aside is also how we calculate unemployment, the rate of unemployment versus, uh, uh, David has the definition for you, uh, of the differences between unemployment and uh, what the government considers un, unemployed people. Um, believe it or not, one of the reasons why accurately tracking unemployment rates through history is difficult is because the definition of unemployment has changed drastically over the years. Right now, the current definition of unemployment by the Department of Labor is that you are out of work, but currently seeking employment. So if you've been out of work for three months and you tell the guy who calls you up on the phone for a random survey that you're not looking for work right now, you are cast out of the um, unemployment rate and are just joined the Americans not in the labor force statistic, which can be inaccurate because it's a self-identified criteria that you're relying on people to individually say they're part of the workforce. So that could even be further distorting unemployment rates is right now, if you look at Americans out of the workforce, a little over half of Americans are not working right now. Now that does include those who are too young and to work and those who are retired and not out of it, but we have hit record highs in um, not in the labor force workers as well. So with that, uh, with those numbers of how high unemployment is and how many people are out of the workforce, you would think if there were job opportunities for many people, a lot of people would jump on them. But there's a lot of factors in play right now that have changed America's outlook on the, on the issue. So financially unemployment, uh, financial unemployment benefits from not working were initially the same as when you were working. So if you're staying at home and you get unemployment insurance uh, through your job, and you apply for it and you receive it, you would be making the same at home, hanging out with your family, maybe uh, isolating, watching TV as if you went to work. So right there, the motivation to go back to work is not that high because you're making the same at home doing nothing, or you could just be relaxing as you would at work. But would be a social impact of that. I mean, that you'd yes. be unfulfilled. Yes, that's true. Um, that's very true. But um, from, uh, you, you might be unfulfilled. You might be missing friends and coworkers, which is co completely understandable. But the fact that you're able to still get enough income, uh, hopefully for your family, um, is still a nice benefit. Uh, but in uh, early March, there was a stimulus pack package that allowed that made people that were unemployed to actually receive more money not working than going back to work which made it even less desirable for people. Is, is, do you think that's a big number of people or is it relatively small? Um, it, I would say it, it's a very large number of people because you could apply under the CARES Act for 
essentially anything. If you owned a business, if you were, if you were a single member business, uh, you can apply for a loan. If your family, if you feel like your family needs more cash, you could apply for a loan. There wasn't really any criteria. The government was giving out money to essentially anyone that said that they needed help. And those reasons could have been frivolous. The government wanted to provide as much, as much help to people. And a lot of people were taking advantage of the system. You could, if you just Google articles of uh, misguided cash uh, for business, Chick-fil-A got a $15 million and they don't need any money. They don't need any financial help. They're doing excellent uh, right now. Uh, uh, numbers wise and their cash flow is doing great and they gave it back. But any company, that wanted free money and a lot of personal families were just asking for money and receiving it on a uh, little to no need basis. Um, so a lot of people who had needs were totally ignored. Exactly. I, I know a lot of people personally that applied for unemployment uh, benefits and needed it and didn't get it. But a lot of businesses that were able to hire people, hire groups and contact the banks first were able to get all the money. Um, the bigger businesses were able to get the money first and a lot of people that didn't need money that uh, were smart about it and went and were the first people before uh, I feel like a lot more educated people were able to get money faster than a lot of less educated people on the issue, especially. Okay. Um, and then on top of it, why it's hard to find unemployed uh, workers is our people are scared to be exposed to COVID and value their health more than money. Now, a lot of people don't think about it like this, but health is actually an asset as well, as well as money. Uh, if, you lose, if you lose your health permanently, like a, I, a lot of people, if they get COVID and have any prior health issues, um, they could severely damage their lungs for the rest of their life. They might have to go on a respirator for the rest of their life. Uh, they could have severe, they could develop uh, abnormal breathing. They may not be able to go back to their job and work the same as they used to if they receive these health complications from the from the disease uh, from COVID, and then as well, uh, and this is starting to get into uh, maybe why uh, it it becomes geographic why uh, it's hard to find uh, people in America to work in New York and some other states. Unemployment benefits were the unemployment office were very good about getting back to a lot of people, not all of them as I said, it was still a big problem, but the people that they were, a lot of people were getting paid and even receiving more than they were while working. But in states such as Pennsylvania, uh, where 35%, uh, Pennsylvania as a state had 35% unemployment, almost twice the national average, um, their call centers and their unemployment offices were so swamped that it would take 41 days to, res to get an email response if you emailed them about the status of your unemployment or tried to receive unemployment through an online application. Now, 41 days for a lot of people, that's over, that's over a well over a month. And a lot of people don't have enough savings uh, and know what to do for that long. Um, what did they do? So uh, people were calling the call centers and they, hire, they were able to hire more people for the call centers, but every minute uh, the employees were getting new emails and, uh, they, the, each worker was mandated to take two phone calls at a time. If you could receive, if you could sound how uh, hectic that is, but people were, uh, people were panicking and people were scared. And a lot of people have just been in uh, horror and uh, just basically fighting for their lives. So they would fly out of state. A lot of people in Pennsylvania were applying to other state jobs and were driving up to four to eight hours to find employment. Now, uh, this was also hard because a lot of p places did, were wary of hiring people from other states um, because they were scared that why are they, it looked fishy to them, like they thought maybe that they have COVID themselves or maybe uh, that there's certain, a, a lot of also convicts were applying to many jobs just looking for work because they didn't get unemployment benefits. And a lot of jobs weren't hiring them as well. So it, it was a big problem in states that had trouble with unemployment uh, benefits and insurance that, that weren't able to get them. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of unemployed workers receiving increased unemployment payments during the pandemic? 
Well, the advantage is uh, with the economy uh, hitting a recessionary period, many people are weary to spend money on frivolous purchases, if not the bare essentials of the classic milk, eggs, um, et cetera. But by increasing people's salary and giving them more money to hire than normal, people won't feel as bad as buying with buying a new pair of shoes if they need it and maybe some new clothes and maybe something for your kids to do during quarantine. Another big part of why uh, the CARES Act and increasing the supply of money to individuals in America is America is a consumption-based economy. Therefore, people need to spend money, need to buy those frivolous things in order for it to become healthier and recover faster. Um, so another big thing, we were talking about the stock market earlier, people's sentiment on the economy affects how well the economy does. If people think the economy is good, even though if the numbers show it's not, the stock market will do well. Uh, and that's a, and if you give people more money and they feel like they're doing better, even if they're out of work, but they're receiving more money than they ever had before, they have a positive outlook. Wow, maybe we could recover because I, while I don't have a job, I'm still getting more money than I ever had before and therefore making the stock market stronger and therefore making the economy stronger. Okay, also, let, people, let's, yeah. something, sir. Megan, I sense you don't agree with what Mark is saying. No, I think that actually completely because right now I'm actually investing in the stock market and I don't have a lot of money. So it's not as fun for me to put more money in because I don't have enough. But I definitely see how if I had more money, and like my brother does, or my dad, who's constantly putting more money into the stocks, uh, how would be like affect me? So I don't know. Brooke, what do you think? I mean, do you think people are taking advantage of the situation and, and not going to work because they're making more? I uh, I know that my brother and dad rather be at work uh, just for like a learning standpoint. I feel like there's so much more benefit when you're actually hands on at your workplace rather than. Uh, at home, there's so many distractions, especially like my dad gets frustrated because we have four kids in our family and it's constant, uh, you know, distracting him and he's higher up in his business. So it's a little bit annoying for him, especially. So he's definitely itching to get back in the office. And my brother goes to the city for his job. Um, so he's definitely looking to get, uh, looking forward to getting back. Especially Brooke, what do you think? Um, I actually have a pretty different experience. My dad's a dentist, so now he's back at work and everything, but when all this was first going on and unemployment was going out, I know he had a lot of problems with hygienists and assistants who didn't work that many days, but then were going to get paid more on unemployment and would rather do that. So I definitely think it kind of depends on the job field and how often you work, because there are some people with younger kids who would rather stay home and just get the unemployment checks. Joe. We've seen this uh, with Jerry Smith. Uh, he got laid off from work and now he's living like a king. Um, <laughs> yeah, tell him about that. Tell him, tell him about that. That was an interesting story. That this, you are supporting Mark's view now. Why don't you share um, the story of our, our student, um, our friend. Uh, our friend in uh, Smith, Jerry, he got laid off from uh, his job, and uh, he's making $6,000 a month uh, uh, just staying at home, sitting on unemployment, and he's just investing it all in the stock market and uh, reaping gains from uh, the Smith and what re the research we've been doing. So it's definitely an interesting time, and I have a bunch of friends who are doing the same thing, just sitting at home uh, and collecting unemployment. So... Um, it's an interesting time to say Paige, the least. Paige, do you think this is just, these are just so, small examples and that most of the program is good or do, are we seeing too much of this? Well, I know my mom is definitely taking advantage of this because she was able to cut her hours 20%, but still make, I think, $600 more a week than she was when she was working five days a week and so I definitely can understand how people are taking advantage of this I also know that like hairdressers are also like not going back into work because they're making so much more money with the unemployment so 
I guess from like looking at the economy, this is a good idea because we are able to increase the income effect. So like people are going to buy more, but then they're like increasing the money supply is only going to increase inflation. So I, I see like both the pros and the cons of it. And I don't necessarily know if I have like a strong opinion for one side or the other, because our, we're so far in debt as a country that I don't always think that creating money is always a good idea because we're like, I last I knew it was like trillions. Mm-hmm. Oh, don't worry. So, we'll be showing you that number the, later. Paige is definitely okay, foreshadowing well. our next, the disadvantage <laughs> slide. Okay. Oh. Jillian. I think, it's think definitely, is- um, I think it's definitely very frustrating to like essential workers that have to be working and they're like not making as much money like going out and putting themselves at risk as people who get to stay at home and collect unemployment. Um, and like all this legislation was rolled out so quickly and it's like some of the fastest legislation to come out in history, which is not an entirely bad thing because Congress and the House wanted to respond to what was going on and help people but I don't know that it's the most thought out and comprehensive thing because of the time crunch. Excellent thought on the whole issue of if I'm an essential worker I have to go to work and here's somebody who is deemed non-essential is making just as much money as me and not putting themselves at risk. I never thought about it that way. Yeah I actually took a class um, this past semester on social problems and public policy and we covered unemployment and how in the United States it's so categorical and it's really hard to kind of collect benefits from the government so I thought it was really interesting when we started hearing about how people who are staying at home collecting unemployment are making more than people who are actually going into work. Interesting. I actually experienced that firsthand because my dad is um, an essential worker in but he works in a prison, so he's not like healthcare. So they obviously weren't getting any extra money, but they also didn't get any protective equipment. Like they didn't have any PPE for about a month and a half. And then that was also when they were starting to like move inmates around to try to condense um, the ones that like were positive for COVID in like one place. And so they were like just kind of moving people without any protection so i definitely agree that it's very frustrating from that aspect too interesting I feel like um, we you don't want to protect your essential workers um, we don't get into it in our slide but there is also an issue that's been cropping up not only amongst essential workers those having to work during this time of crisis but those essential workers that are able to work remotely via those that are forced to come in there's also social pressures occurring because of that as well very true um i mean uh just uh one advantage of some places I mean, now this comes to essential workers versus not having workers in Japan. They've been getting around a lot of shopping uh, issues and essential workers uh, selling groceries is they have a lot of electronic based uh, grocery stores where everything is just on the shelves and you just scan it as you walk out the door and you don't have anyone working there. And it's very good if you're not trying to get people sick, but also then it comes to the thing do you want to hire someone versus have a robot do it? But that's a whole other topic. That's just something to think about, though. Okay. Sahar? Um, well, I think that, yes, the government rolled out the stimulus plan real quickly. And it wasn't thought out. But the thing is, what is the alternative? Not putting back money in the economy? Like, what would have happened? I get the whole argument between essential work. And, and, and yes, so the world is not fair. And we all know that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, like, crippling the economy and like not like all these people like there's a, a big majority of these people who are living on this on unemployment yes yeah. some people might be taking advantage um but at the same time like even those people who are taking advantage are pouring the money back into the economy because they still need to eat they still need to shop they still need to do things you know um i mean like yeah i mean this is the way like the government is trying to like uh, like move the economy, you know, yeah. uh, as if so just like halting it completely. I mean, what would have happened? Sure. Valentina. Uh, 
Um, I definitely agree that um, a lot of people are taking advantage of the unemployment. Like I know a lot, I know I personally know a lot of people who have just blown out the money like a couple weeks after they've gotten it. And I think it's just a little ridiculous because there are people who need it more. And like my parents are both um, healthcare workers and um, my mom thankfully was able to work from home remotely, but my dad still had to go to work and he still had to come back. And it's just like, um, of course it's helping the economy. Like as Sahar said, you know, they're putting it back into um, like, you know, buying groceries, buying all the essential things, but there's definitely, um, you definitely see a difference in those who are abusing of it and taking advantage of it, but also those who really needed it because there are many people who really need that unemployment money that just can't rely on anything else because their job has, you know, a lot of people are out of like, you know, closing their businesses because they simply, they simply couldn't keep it up anymore. And it's really essential for them as well. Okay. I was going to say one last thing that is interesting for you guys to think about. They rolled out this bill super fast and were able to give $2 trillion stimulus package at the, one of the fastest legislations ever passed. What happened if they started the testing for COVID and <laughs> the precautionary measures and put past the bill for that uh, precautionary measures as fast? Do you think that we might not even be in this situation as in other countries. I, I have a client in New Zealand and I was shocked about three weeks ago, they had their last case oh, yeah. uh, out the door. They're COVID free in, and there's many other con countries following suit where they have less than a million cases. Um, that, well, they have, they, they have, uh, they have, I'm uh, sorry, less than a hundred thousand cases like total in their whole country. And it's, uh, and it's been decreasing steadily every week. So interesting. It's just something to think about. I don't think that we were honestly like well equipped enough to deal with that stage of things. I almost think that for America, this stage of kind of just doing damage control was inevitable because like we, we just were not prepared. So I think we're seeing the consequences of that now and hopefully that'll help us as a country prepare better in the future so that if diseases like this do keep cropping up, we're better prepared and don't have to kind of experience such economic and social turmoil. Yeah, I agree. And also, like, to go off of that, um, with, like, New York State reopening, like, and other states also reopening, like, I definitely think that, you know, obviously there's good intentions with that because businesses need to start up again and people need to start working again. But there's also, you've also seen an increase in cases in, like, Ohio and Alabama and Florida. And it's just, like, you know, what are the benefits and what are the um, cons in this? Like, what, what are we actually benefiting from if we're opening stores and opening um restaurants people are just getting sick and sick like maybe like the death toll has decreased but people are still getting infected and we're not fighting that and also i was speaking to my to my dad and you know there you know a lot of pharmaceutical companies are really rushing into getting um a vaccine out um as quickly as possible but it's really it's really worrying because you know the vaccines that we have now that we've gotten since we were kids have been tested for like 20 years um, and this vaccine, you know, it's being rushed in a couple months and we don't know how effective it will be or, you know, just mm -hmm. put it out there. Great point. Okay, David, you ready to go to the next slide? Yep. <laughs> um, this will go into our disadvantages of unemployment as well. But one of the issues uh, that affects companies even beyond just COVID is the current issue of pay compression. It is a phenomenon that ar arises when a company is unable to maintain an adequate difference in pay to compensate more experienced workers um, and the wages required to entice new workers to join the company. Um, a couple of years ago, I was uh, attached to a company and we had this problem. It's bad for experienced workers as they feel like they're being, their work is being undervalued when they've been working for a company for 10 years. They're only making 18 bucks an hour. And now you have all these new kids that are coming in that are instantly starting off with 15 bucks an hour. It doesn't feel like they're being adequately compensated for their investment in the company and can entice employee, already existing employees to leave. Um, it's also bad for employers as they now have to pay more uh, both explicitly for less experienced labor in the wages, but also implicitly as they now have to take away 
from some of those more advanced employees to either teach the less experienced labor so they're not able to output as much or through management costs having to more closely supervise uh, new labor as they're not able to um, as efficiently work on their own so they're less valuable at that higher rate of cost as well. Um, this so wouldn't that cause me to want to go to another firm if they're hiring somebody? I make, say, 15 bucks an hour and the new people are making 20. Why don't oh, I just leave and go to another firm? Absolutely. But the problem is in some businesses, the profit margins can be so low that that also forces pay compression um, to within a business sector. Um, during a previous slide I mentioned, or during a previous presentation, I did bring up the issue of the food service industry as an example, has a reputation for some of the lowest profit margins um, of any industry in the US right now. It can be a problem for more experienced workers. Let's say you've been a line chef for the last 10 years. Um, you're the company is only able to pay you throwing out numbers 18 bucks an hour but with fight for 15 um new workers are only willing to start working for you um let's say with the risks of covid the risk of getting sick they'll only work for you for 15 bucks an hour minimum wage you as a more experienced employee now have the issue of your industry now has mandated that your wage is effectively capped at 18 bucks an hour, but the only way they can get new people into the industry is paying them a much higher rate of 15 bucks an hour. It, it can make it difficult for existing employees um, being able to jump jobs if their industry says mm -hmm. their experience isn't worth as much, and it does present more costs for employers and can make it harder for them to hire new people even in this unemployment period because mm -hmm. of those uh, margins being even tighter and sure. in, in, in not even in a cutthroat margin industry for example no. the gentleman that was hiring for the, the for the article um, in Vermont uh, to make these play sets uh, for kids in order to match what the people were making after the stimulus package came out uh, in the CARES Act the bonus that people were getting from unemployment he would have to pay a hundred percent more of the current wage he was paying the workers. So if he was paying them $14 an hour, he would actually have to pay them $28 an hour just to equal the amount of money they were making through unemployment each week. Interesting. Which he then also has the issue of, sure, demand is higher now, but what happens after it's over? How many of these workers will then leave um, to pursue work more in line with their original job goals? And how many workers is he going to have to lay off to meet the new lesser demand after COVID is finished as well? Are also issues impacting how much he can pay workers during the current pandemic and high unemployment? Okay. Very true. So now the disadvantages. There's a lot of disadvantages. So unemployment. Uh, so starting out, looking back a little bit through history. So unemployment uh, workers become unmotivated, sedentary, and will not uh, voluntarily look for work, especially when they're getting paid more than ever for not working. We, see, we saw this direct result in 2008 and 2009 after the economic crash based on different factors than there are now. Um, when people lost their jobs and more than half their net worth, they became depressed and unmotivated to go back to the workforce. Many were not still un earning unemployment, work, but still didn't want to look for jobs because of the hardships that they had to go through. Now that people are getting, a lot of people are getting paid and getting paid more than ever, uh, people are gonna become, I, I believe, that we're gonna see a higher trend of sedentary workers not wanting to work. And especially with the health concerns, um, there's gonna be less motivation for people to wanna to get back to work as quickly. Um, now uh, we're gonna, uh, so now we're going to go to a, another huge disadvantage. So the government, as we know, is always in debt um, and has been for uh, many, many years. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. It's okay. No problem. Uh, but, to, but in order to give uh, the workers additional money uh, and the aid relief, the government created the CARE Act, which is, was a $2 trillion relief package that uh, we created. Uh, but the thing is, we had to get this $2 trillion from somewhere. We had, the government created the money, 
which in turn devalues U.S. currency against other currencies um, and uh, will cause inflation eventually. And it will create and it will be harder to recover longer term because we accrue more debt. So uh, Dave is going to show you the debt clock. Um, so the debt clock, national debt is, this is live. So this is how fast it's increasing currently. Uh, every second it's increasing about ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, not more. Um, and it increases uh, faster uh, every second. It's kind of stressful to watch if you look at all the numbers and how large our debt's getting. But right now we've hit around $26 trillion dollars in national uh, in U.S. debt, and we increased so far since January of 2020. We've already increased three over three trillion dollars this year. Now the average from 2012 um, up to 2019 was around 800 billion dollars to uh, one trillion dollars a year, and it's hard to fathom just how big these numbers truly are. Um, just to give you put in perspective, um, I think it was like a million seconds is uh, a a year where a billion seconds is like 115 years or something to that effect. Um, but it's the the debt has soared tremendously, and we're only halfway through the year. If we have to increase, keep increasing the amount of money we pour into the economy to make it better, we're not just going to have a short term problem of inflation and a devaluation of our currency, but we're gonna have an even longer term problem of never being able to handle this debt with other countries and we might have to go bankrupt and it could cause world turmoil. So why did we just not let the free market economy handle this whole situation and not do anything? Because I, I would say first off, because it's a black swan event and we don't really know how a free market economy will work in uh, a, in a black swan event, uh, especially because this isn't it strictly an economic based uh, uh, ec economy. It's not strictly the stock market didn't crash strictly based on economic factors. And also it didn't strictly crash based on any other factors we've seen in the past. It's based on a pandemic. Okay. Um, and I would say pandemics, uh, especially we won't know how long it will really last fully. And I feel it's sad to say, but I feel like the American people aren't smart enough to handle it by themselves. And that the stimulus package was needed to try to push people. They're trying to basically the government's trying to push people in the right direction by, by giving them the more money to spend. It's not like people are, I, I said people were spending frivolously before, but the whole point of the stimulus package was to put money back into the economy. So they were expecting people, what do Americans, what are the Americans the best at doing it better than anyone else in the world? Spending money. So the, they're not good at saving money, but they're the best at spending money in the world. I, I okay. do disagree slightly with that interpretation. I believe the issue isn't that Americans aren't smart enough to handle this themselves. I just believe that politically we're unwilling to stomach the cost of letting this correct it by ourselves. We have become unfortunately too reliant on external intervention within the marketplace that the cost to let the market correct itself naturally is something that we're not willing to stomach. Mm -hmm. um, I think another factor is um, a lot of employees are like laying people off. In other countries you see there are lockdowns, but these, are, these people are still within the workforce. They're getting paid to work. Mm -hmm. um, um, or like, but like here, like the massive layoffs that happen, um, I mean, who, what's going to happen to these people? You're talking about what, like 14, 15 million people, uh, yeah. without jobs, mm -hmm. like who's, who's gonna, where are they going to go? Exactly. You know? And a free market economy, basically those people would have to create new jobs or find a new way to make money or learn new skill set. When and you're not help. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine where you're not, where you don't have to like abide by a quarant like lockdowns and exactly. Like yeah. So yeah, again, it, it would be, I think too difficult. Um, even if people handled it, could find an appropriate solution. There is no appropriate solution for this large of a, a correction and factor. Yeah. 
So. Um, but going back to how employers are going to have to counter this, unfortunately, uh, with pay compression, having to compete against unemployment, they are going to have and their ability to attract workers through pay, they're going to have to find alternate means to recruit employees. They're going to need to work on non-pay incentives to bring employees back into the workforce. Example are profit sharing agreements, probably, where we can't pay you as much, but if we make really good profits, then you're guaranteed a percentage of those uh, to help entice you to work. Um, some companies are going to have to work on either handing out shares for X amount of time working for them or perhaps uh, subsidize really good uh, matching programs that you work for a company that you buy shares in our in the company that you work for will give you really good matching rates uh, on our shares. Uh, employers will need to start providing roadmaps to show employees, hey, not only will you, we guarantee you work, but here is the roadmap for if you meet these requirements, we can get you higher in the company. So not only just working for us, but promotion opportunities within our company as well. Employers will also need to stop with some of the employment games that they've played in the past. Like they're going to have to actually drop some of these, um, in my opinion, horrendous zero hour contracts and start actually um, signing up employees with guaranteed work hours, which uh, have also been a problem in the past as well. Good. I'm sorry, was there a question? Good. So, uh, so we we believe that so uh, Congress need, will need to discontinue the expanded unemployment uh, plans and extra payments that they're making, because despite Americans needing money at this time, Congress needs to come up with a plan to phase out the assisted, uh, the assisted uh, money that they're giving in attempt for people, because it'll just uh, continue the cycle of people not uh, attempting to look for work. Uh, again, 2008, 2009, uh, it was un unmotivated workers and people stayed on unemployment, not truly looking for work that kept the economy in a downturn for as long as it lasted. This time, the advantage is the virus keep, keeping people from working in populated areas, but once a vaccine and health concerns are on a decline, vaccines developed and health concerns are, are on a decline, people can start heading back to work and they just need to be guided with the government at the forefront, I believe. Um, and then to counter that, uh, I, I do agree with that if it was just about unemployment itself, that we do need to figure out a way to phase those out. But within the broader issue that we're currently facing beyond COVID, I think politically we are going to be forced to continue uh, expanded unemployment, though we might necessarily uh, need to uh, adjust how those payments are out. Uh, the reason for that is going back all the way to 2008, the global financial crisis, we had the businesses that were deemed too big to fail and the government had to pen, pay out billions of dollars to keep these companies afloat because they were unwilling to suffer the political and financial consequences of letting the free market deal with these companies in the traditional way of letting them close, all of that unemployment, we weren't willing to accept that. The but now we're back in the same situation. Right. And, and we dealt with it in 2008, we probably wouldn't have been here. Um, unfortunately, but the problem is we determined that we were not politically willing to stomach that cost back exactly. then. And now the problem has been built up even more to correct for both now and 2008 would be twice as bad. And as I said, we're not willing to stomach it. The problem was back in 2008, you saw in 2011, the when people were finally able to put themselves back together, you had the Occupy Wall Street movement that came up to counter that. Uh, people were concerned with why companies that directly led to the financial crisis were allowed to be bailed out and effectively rewarded for their actions uh, that led to that crisis. Now, this current one, it's not the fault of Wall Street. It is the fault of the Chinese Communist Party for not warning the world that they had several months of lead time that this was a problem and they could have let warned us to allow us to provide better um, stop gap measures in place to avoid the extent of this pandemic. But beyond no that, what we did here in the U.S. Yeah. But <laughs> employees since 2008 have 
faced still even further issues to them. These companies that are being bailed out now have tried to phase out workers through globalization, um, using cheaper labor overseas, automa uh, automation, replacing workers with new systems where you can have one worker do the work of like 50 other people before with electronic systems, changes in skill preferences, older manufacturing workers are now less desirable and more with IT backgrounds to fix the robots that are doing mm -hmm. most of the manufacturing. I, I think that the political costs uh, that the uh, companies face uh, as they're more highly leveraged now than even back in 2008 they will they won't exist without government bailouts and unfortunately I believe our government will be forced to pay them out to keep those employers afloat but without increased benefits to employees who are out of work granted there is uh, examples of a lot of people taking advantage of this but with the social unrest that could result if those unemployed stay unemployed for a longer period without pay uh, could be potentially disastrous. I feel unfortunately some of the current unrest we're seeing in the street is being magnified by employees uh, or people, the fears that they have of the future, not being able to financially take care of themselves. And that could only get worse if the government was not to continue paying out bailouts to uh, okay. through extended unemployment. Okay. 